Thank you for the introduction. And I'm thankful to have had the opportunity to work with the Health Equity Collaborative and have the guidance of our elders and their wisdom and want to recognize Elder Roberta Price, Elder Bill White, and Elder Shane Point of Musqueam. Today, I'm going to talk about safety and healthcare. Stereotypes and assumptions about Indigenous, Black, people of color, people with disabilities, and sexually and gender diverse people result in discrimination, racism, internalized racism, homophobia, transphobia, and ableism. The intersectionality of these identities creates barriers to safety and to equitable access to healthcare. My hope is that this can change. I'm gonna be sharing a part of my history and my erased history and talking about what is visible and what's invisible. What's visible to anyone who can see is my blackness. To the point where it overshadows all the other pieces of my identity mentioned in my bio. What people usually can't see is my Indigenous heritage. It may also be a challenge at a glance to determine my gender identity or my sexual orientation. My accessibility issues are hidden in this format as well, because you can't see that I have mobility issues or that I'm experiencing vision loss. So if I told you about those aspects of myself, you'd have to believe me. I have a quote in the report that says, anti-Black racism kind of almost cost me my vision. I think the kind of almost, because I couldn't really believe that that was happening to me. It's a long story, but to condense it, for over 18 months, I had serious eye problems. I continuously had eye irritation, inflammation, weeping, and copious amounts of discharge. For a full year, my eyes sealed shut overnight and would take almost an hour in the morning to coax open so I could go about my day and attempt to function. I tried to seek medical care repeatedly. I was told that it was allergies, which I have, but never like that. I was treated with allergy medication and dry eye drops that I ironically was allergic to. It was obviously a painful condition. One doctor said, it must be hard for people to look at you. I was told that my eyelids were tough and kind of hard to examine. They didn't know what they were looking for. Various doctors kept saying my eyelids were pink and a good color and that they weren't infected. However, my eyelids aren't pink. Pink eyelids that my eyes had been rubbed raw. I've lived in this body for 55 years. I would know what color my eyelids are, but continuously I was told pink was good. Pink wasn't good for me. I was in that state for a really long time as people wouldn't believe me. I eventually got a last resort treatment that resulted in me having extremely high eye pressure. Normal is in the range of 10 to 22. And there's a danger of immediate permanent vision loss at levels over 40. At the point where I was seeking emergency eye care continuously, my eye pressure was around 37. At its peak, about 48 to 53. I was told it seemed I could tolerate higher eye pressure than most humans. My vision was entirely obscured by that point. At first I was seeing halos and eventually rainbows around every piece of light getting darker and darker to the point where all there was was bright, bright rainbows everywhere, totally overtaking my vision. Kind of funny to think I had the queerest eye disease ever. The rainbows were strangely beautiful, but not good because I was going blind and it was scary. Eventually there was a doctor who offered me an experimental treatment because frequently people of color are experimented on. To this day, when I go to the pharmacy, they say, oh, don't put this in your eyes, which is exactly what I was told to do with it. Now I've gotten to the point where the conditions are medically controlled, but over that time I experienced a 50% loss of vision, which is still deteriorating. 
in the beginning, I said, anti-Black racism almost cost me my vision. And I think the privileges I've accumulated and the hidden pieces of my identity may have been what saved me. I'm not visibly Indigenous, which could have negatively affected my safety while accessing care. The privilege of having a job with health benefits and having resources for transportation to multiple appointments, as well as English being my first language, reduced the barriers I had accessing the available gender binary based heteronormative healthcare the system has to offer. I think that my and others' negative healthcare experiences could have been avoided by valuing people's lived experience and knowledge of their own bodies. In my case, it would have helped having doctors educated on how to treat Black people and how to recognize conditions on Black skin, like rashes, bruising, diagnosing certain cancers, and now needing to recognize symptoms of COVID-19. It seems medical professionals can't recognize many things on this body, and I don't understand why. I know there's enough black and brown cadavers to study on. We've lost a lot of our people due to them not being able to access healthcare that is safe. My hope is that this can change. And I'm hoping that the recommendations from our HEC report are enacted by the people with the power to make those changes hearing this presentation, because immediate action is needed to support system change and increase safety. Change in the form of resources and funding for peer-led programming and peer staffing to support medical and social services, in addition to education and training on cultural safety and humility, will result in medical practitioners having the knowledge they need to treat racialized and marginalized people. My hope is that patients being believed becomes the norm and not the exception. Medical practitioners having access to ethical, anti-oppressive informed data would also change this system. And my hope is one day we get there. Thank you. <laughs>